meeting is being recorded. Greetings and peace, everyone. Uh, I wish you all a great evening, wherever you might be watching us from. Tonight, I have the honor and privilege of being joined by my friend and brother from Texas, Dr. Robert L. Uzzle. And tonight, the conversation that we are going to have is about the Durham's of Fairfield and African-American genealogy. And in this book, it's, it's such an extensive history of the Durham family that I've thoroughly enjoyed about this beautiful family and how the origins that they come from, from Gobi and Mary and their seven generations, and to this day with the Durham family from South Carolina to Louisiana to Texas, being involved in all professions across the states, contributing much to their communities and the world. And I'm so thankful to Dr. Uzzle for the great work that he has written. I've thoroughly enjoyed it learning about this family and I am with him to make sure that the legacy of this family is preserved. So without further ado, a, a very much good evening and hello to brother Bob Uzzle. Good evening. Thank you for being here. The, the first question that I have, my dear brother, is uh, writing this book about the Durham family legacy. What challenges did you face in terms of making sure compiling all of this information together and how your journey started and what inspired you to do this? Okay, uh, February 19th of this year, Deborah and I celebrated our 45th wedding anniversary. And uh, when we were uh, we only dated four months before we got married, so it was a whirlwind courtship. But yeah. during that time, one of the big, uh, a very popular TV series mm -hmm. uh, was uh, Alex Haley's Roots. It was a, a TV miniseries. And uh, Alex Haley, for those who don't know, was a very prominent African-American author. His first book, you know what that was, don't you? Well, Alex you know Haley's? Yes, The Four Roots. Yes, that's right. What, but Roots was not his first book. What was his first book? The first book, that I don't know. The Autobiography of Malcolm X. Oh, right, right. And uh, uh, you need to do uh, devote a podcast to Malcolm sometime. He was such a awesome individual. You know, of course, it was Malcolm X's story as told Alex Haley. Yes. And... Uh, but uh, Alex Haley, uh, according to what he said, he went to, uh, you know, growing up in Henning, Tennessee, he would sit on the porch and his uh, grandmother and some aunts uh, and uh, one cousin would, would, would be out there and they'd be talking about the family history. Hmm. And he absorbed a lot of that. And then it was his cousin, Georgia Anderson, who was the youngest of the uh, uh, of the ladies that sat there, uh, said that she uh, well when he after the, the he of course was quite shook up after Malcolm was killed. Malcolm mm -hmm. said that uh, he didn't think he was going to live long enough to see the book in its completed form, and he was right because he knew he was a marked man. Well, what did that X signify? That was the lost African name. Uh, because the you know the slave master gave them their names, and he said, uh, <clears throat> she said, well, you know, our name, our name is Kente. Our ancestor was Kunta Kente, and there there are a lot of uh, problems from a research perspective as far as what Alex Haley did and did not do right. But uh, that's mm. neither here nor there. Uh, and but he said that in or Jukari, the village that. Kunta Kinte allegedly came from in the Gambia. Uh, he, he learned it was the very same hour that he set foot in Jupiter that Georgia Anderson died in the hospital in Kansas City. And that had to be uh, quite a interesting, uh, more than coincidental event. Yeah. But I was inspired by Alex Haley and I, I started asking questions. And the, one of the biggest challenges to start out with was that was, was apathy i mean it just seemed to be nobody really had in the family had any experience with genealogy it was quite uh commonly noted that they had come from louisiana but a big mm -hmm. question i had that nobody had an answer for 
Where right. in Louisiana did they come from? And uh, there was also, uh, you know, some one of the older family members had told me that uh, before that they were in South Carolina. Gobby also refers sometimes they pronounce the name Gubby. Yeah, yeah. Was, uh, was a, uh, uh, an African for whom they were descended, and he was a slave in South Carolina. But where in South Carolina? And, uh, and the attitude was that it didn't really matter. It wasn't important. I said, oh, yes, it is. <laughs> and, and one of the problems, of course, back in those days, we didn't have Ancestry.com. Yes. The amount, the number of resources that are available uh, for genealogical research today is tremendous. And of course, we didn't have the internet back then, period. Right. And so if a person wants to trace their family, tree, there's a lot more available than there was back then. Mm -hmm. And uh, but uh, I would I became quite adept at using uh, microfilms in the library going through census records and slave schedules that list uh, the name of slave owners. And uh, uh, one of the big problems about that, though, slave schedules do not list slaves by their first names. They give the name and gender and a few other elements about them, if, uh, whether they were black or mulatto, and if a person, if they were blind or, or lame or anything like that, that might be included, of course. I can imagine that the census takers in that day and time, the furthest thing from their mind was the idea that in the future, the descendants of these slaves would want to trace their family tree. And, you know, they, uh, mm. some of the spelling is not that good. And uh, it's, uh, so there's a lot of challenges there. And, but I was de to determined to get that information. And so, uh, it was in, um, not only did I go to the library and research, I wrote Buku's letters, hmm. uh, all over various, various places. And, uh, I received a phone call in early 1983 from the late Donald Smith Durham, mm -hmm. uh, who was one of the white Durhams. Yes. Uh, he, he was in the U S army stationed at the Pentagon at the time he lived in Manassas, Virginia, the, where the famous civil war battle bull run was fought and uh he was uh he was uh um he's i he called in response to a letter that i had sent and he said i believe you're in touch with the right family here mm -hmm. and he had done quite a bit of research on his family and they were slave owners and uh my uh research indicated that uh Don's ancestor, Robert Winfield Durham, died in Fairfield County in 1852. Mm -hmm. And his widow, Mosey Eliza Durham, and three of their sons, uh, Osmond L. Durham, Durham mm -hmm. Walton Hightower Durham, and John Franklin Durham, all came and established residence in DeSoto Parish, Louisiana, mm -hmm. uh, which that's Mansfield is the parish seat. It's down below Shreveport and that they brought their slaves with them. Uh, Alan Durham, my wife's ancestor, was born in South Carolina. His son, Rance, was born in Louisiana. Hmm. And then you examine the census records after the Civil War in Texas and Louisiana, uh, and you find uh, black Durhams, uh, some from South Carolina, some from Louisiana, and in the Texas records in Freestone County, even found some from Alabama. <laughs> that fits right in because Osman L. Durham lived in Alabama for at least 10 years before mm -hmm. moving to Louisiana. He was firmly established in DeSoto Parish in 1850. But uh, the, uh, so the, more than likely, these uh, slaves born in Alabama were, were his slaves, that their descendants yeah. who came on to Texas. And uh, the, uh, one of my students a number of years ago was Richard Durham uh, Jr. And he, uh, Richard, uh, I signed, he was my wife's like eighth cousin and I, I signed him to research his, his side of the family and he did. And he uh, found out about uh, his, his ancestor, Isaac Durham, 
was born in Texas in August 15, 1860. And by the way, Richard's birthday is August 15, 1980. And mm-hmm. <laughs> that, that was <laughs> one. And he, uh, uh, but, but his, wife, his mother, Mary, gave birth shortly after arriving in Texas. Apparently she was, uh, it was after uh, Gobby was murdered that she came to Texas and, yeah. and delivered uh, this youngest son. And the others had, some had already, were already in Louisiana, but they were able to reconnect after the Civil War. Again, you didn't have telephones back then and communication was not what it is now. Yeah. I'm sure this was not the only case like that, but there were people managed to get back in touch. They, uh, they found out they, their mother and their baby brother were living in Freestone County, Texas. So here they come. And uh, Highway 84 goes directly from Fairfield, Texas, county seat of Freestone County, to Mansfield, county seat of DeSoto Parish, Louisiana. It goes directly between the two today. Mm-hmm. It was probably a dirt road and trail uh, during Reconstruction. It was on April the 8th of 1864 at Mansfield. The battle was fought there, and that was the last uh, Confederate victory of the war. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I've been to a reenactment there. There were a number of men uh, from Freestone County who fought at the Battle of Mansfield, and they had planned on disbanding the unit in San Antonio. <clears throat> but as it turned out, uh, they ended up, uh, uh, there were so many of them were from, from Fairfield, that's where they disbanded the unit when they, they came through. And the Valverde Cannon, it's in front of the Freestone County Courthouse in Fairfield, was used at the Battle of Mansfield. Mm-hmm. And so the and the rural slaves were somewhere, I don't know how close they were to the battlefield, but they were the, they were somewhere in that area. And, you know, I, I thank you, Brother Bob, for sharing all of this information that you have. And it just shows you how extensive this family has become. And I know if uh, Gobi and Mary were looking down today, they would be happy to see how far the Durham family has extended, not only from South Carolina to Louisiana to Alabama to Texas. And the, and the beautiful legacy that they have preserved being involved in all sorts of professions and contributions to humanity. Which goes to my next question, my brother, when doing this research and putting this book and work together, what challenges did you face? And how did you overcome them? Well, again, uh, as I was saying a while ago, the idea that uh, it wasn't important to know where they came from. I was Mm -hmm. able to nail all this stuff down and eventually let me, let me tell you how it actually started that it, within my own family. My wife's attitude at the first, at the first was, I know my parents. I know my grandparents. That's as far back as I care to go. But I can tell you, she's not saying that now. <laughs> Absolutely. And, uh, Absolutely. It was uh, a, lot, a lot of them eventually, they, they, uh, they caught the bug as well. They recognized that uh, this was something important. <laughs> and it took uh, little by little, I was able to, to connect with different branches of the family, do interviews, get it all down. And then uh, I found a publisher once the book came out, uh, there were some people say, hey, can, how come we were not in there? And I said, well, you look, we sent out questionnaires. We, we uh, made uh, many efforts to get people to provide information. And if they didn't provide it, well, that's just too bad. Yeah. Even a yeah. few years, a, a revision is done, and we'll try to include more of that there, um, of course. And uh, as I, I in the um, introduction, I point out that sadly there were many people who had a great little enthusiasm about it, such as Archie Durham, mm-hmm. who played the guy. Uh, who didn't live to see the book completed, but I'd like to see Archie uh, is looking down and smiling. Uh, Indeed. Indeed. Uh, he, he was, he lived to be 95. I understand the only time in his life he ever was late for work. He was at church. The sermon was so good. He lost track of time, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he, 
he was truly a great guy. And we've had, had a lot, a lot of great people in the family, uh, brother Johnny Johnson, mm-hmm. uh, was a, his mother was a Durham. And he said that, uh, <clears throat> Johnny said that, uh, he was the one who told me about Gobby being born in South Carolina and, uh, about the story of, uh, the, uh, the exit, the murder, you know, his tongue torn out by its roots and all that. Yeah. And he, uh, (laughs) uh, he, yeah, I wasn't familiar with that. Well, anyway, but he, uh, said that, uh, uh, one time when I preached at Lone Star Baptist church, uh, he said, he said, told me I was making him sound like a very important man. I said, well, Johnny, you are an important man. (laughs) That's right. And it was, uh, there are a lot of, we had a lot of very important, important people in the family and uh, every family that's true. But, uh, I have had other families down there that express some interest. And, uh, for example, where I live now in Corsicana, there's some Mannings and, uh, mm-hmm. I've told them that, uh, Hillary Manning was one of the leading slave owners in Hill County and in, in Freestone County mm-hmm. before the civil war. And they're probably descended from him. I'd be delighted. If somebody would take that ball and run with it and do a book on the Manning family. I don't plan to do that myself. But uh, anyway, uh, the uh, this uh, and and I've gotten communications from Durham's, primarily black, but some white and some even a few Asian Durham's, mm. and and some have raised questions about uh, that. Sometimes I had the answer, sometimes I didn't, and I said. I can't claim that every black Durham in the United States is, is descended from Bobby. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can't make that yet. But at the same time, I hope this will inspire others to research their side of the family and come up with something. Indeed, indeed. And you have given me that inspiration as well, my brother, not only just learning about the Durham family, but to realize what you have stated in this book that if you don't know who you are, you won't be able to take control of your fate in the future. You, know, you need to know. Yeah, how you can't know who you are unless you know where you came from. Exactly. That's and you, 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 you emphasize that very and well in this book about uh, your identity. And that, 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 I believe, my brother, is uh, so important about reclaiming this identity. And it just comes to, comes to my next question. How has this book rewarded you spiritually in your life? Well, uh, I feel like uh, it's, it was a, a major goal. It took me nearly 40 years to achieve. Uh-huh. But uh, uh, it, it is always satisfaction in yes. achieving a goal especially worked on it a long time. And uh, for those of us who are writers, completing a writing project uh, is something very, uh, always very satisfying. I'm, I've talked with people in recent years who have skills that I don't have. Um, mm. I talked to a guy not long ago. He likes to restore old cars. I can imagine that is a great deal of satisfaction when that's done. Yes, yes. I've talked to people who work in the construction field who are very good at what they do. And to see a finished product in front of them, that's got to be a great feeling. Again, I don't have those skills. Mm -hmm. A person could be an artist or a musician or many other things. uh, And when when they accomplish something they've set out to accomplish, that's always a good feeling. And so uh, I've had... A lot of family members who have been um, appreciative of what I've done and and they the idea that it's, uh, you know, they were able to resilience, they were able to overcome Mm -hmm. and and stay together in spite of, of, you know, slavery was a horrible system. There's no question about that. Yes. But there were a lot of people who overcame it, who did uh, segregation and and all the other stuff that, that's gone on in this country, it's uh, certainly wrong. But uh, mm-hmm. there were people who, who said, well, there's nothing I could do, so I'm just going to resign myself to fate. Mm-hmm. Others who determined to make a difference and did and are still making a difference. That's right, my brother. And uh, you have 
also made a big difference by preserving the legacy of his family. For those that are learning about the struggles that people have went through, they can't just simply discount saying that this is what you went through or this is what this person went through. It gives you a greater appreciation for the people that struggled to come to the point that they are today because of the sacrifices of their ancestors, which goes to my next question. My hey, let me brother. mention this. Yes. I don't know if there, if, can I ask something what's on my mind? Please, in, please. I don't even know if I mentioned this, but in Philadelphia, where you are, uh -huh. uh, of course, I'm with the AME Church, uh, Clayton and Jeremiah Durham mm -hmm. were friends of Richard Allen, who helped in organizing the church. And if you ever have the opportunity to find out anything about them and share that information with me, I would love to have it. I do not know if they were related to the Durham's of Fairfield or not. They were free men in the North. Uh, when the General the AME Organizing Conference was in 1816 in Philadelphia, mm -hmm. one of the delegates from Philadelphia was Reverend Clayton Durham, but and he had a brother named Jeremiah. But Got it. that's all I know. Mm -hmm. I, I will keep that in mind, and I have noted that in my notes. And also, my brother, it goes to my next question. Did you find any extended relatives for, for your wife, Deborah that she was not aware of before? Plenty. <laughs> uh, and uh, some uh, from South Carolina, uh, when we were still at Ennis at Wayman Chapel, one Sunday morning, Donald Durham walked in, and uh, he was – he's. I uh, saw him this, this last summer. Uh, he's a manager of a Sonic Drive-In at uh, uh, Forney, Texas, mm -hmm. near Terrell, where I was working. And, but Don is uh, a uh, very distant relative. He's part of the Fairfield County, South Carolina group. And we were in Sunday school, and he and his wife and daughter walk in, and I said, uh, and stop everything, Deborah. Here's a long lost cousin from South Carolina, <laughs> and uh, there uh, it's not been unusual for me to uh, find someone. Well, this is X number of cousins away. Right. My grandson Richard Walker, when he uh, uh, had had uh, became uh, before when we first went to Ennis, he said, "I have a friend in Ennis, Justin Durham." I said, "No, you don't. You have a cousin there." Justin Durham, mm -hmm. and found out they were 10th cousins, I believe. And it's, you know, and I've had uh, nieces and nephews and grandkids who've gotten A's on extra credit reports by uh, writing a report about their family tree. Not many kids have their family back eight or nine generations. Yes, that's absolutely correct, my brother. Most only know their parents or grandparents or to the very maximum, their great grandparents. But most people do not really know how far it really goes back. And that is a in today's generation, it's um, commendable for anyone who does make the effort to put something like that together, like yourself have. And it not only inspired me, but I hope all those that are watching this are inspired and take action to find out who they are and where they come from, like you have taught in this book. Which goes to my next question, my brother, is during your search for the Durham family, did you encounter any fellow brother Masons in the Durham family while researching? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. In fact, uh, the late uh, oh, uh, let's see, Holbert Durham, uh, uh, Hobart Durham uh, was, uh, he was a worshipful master and he had a bunch of sons. He initiated most of them to the lodge there in Butler. Sadly, mm -hmm. that lodge doesn't exist anymore. But uh, yeah, Hobart uh, and Richard uh, Sr. and George and Isaac uh, are still living. Bascom passed away last year. Mm -hmm. uh, he, they were all brothers. Uh, they've got pictures of some of them in the book. They're, uh, uh, and quite a few of them have been in the military. Quite a few have been in law enforcement. George retired from the Harris County Sheriff's Department. Isaac worked uh, with the Freestone County Sheriff's Department and then some, some other areas. Uh, 
Richard uh, retired from the Texas Department of Criminal Justice down around Palestine. Uh, so they have, uh, they've all been in, the, in this particular group. Uh, in fact, I know Isaac Durham Sr., the one that was born at Butler in 1860, was uh, uh, a master mason. And they, uh, Rance uh, was a, uh, a phenomenal individual, you know, entrepreneur in his day, and was uh, he was I think it was called Pantomp Lodge at the time. It's long gone. He was also active in the Pantomp Methodist Church, which is now Union United Methodist. Pantomp Cemetery and Lone Star Cemetery are the two main cemeteries out there where you find a lot of girls. Yes, buried. yes, and of course. I visited quite a few cemeteries, and I never will forget uh, there were two churches up there in, in South Carolina by Lake Watery. Yeah. Uh, the Good Hope and uh, White, White Oak cemeteries, and there was one of them that I was, we had gotten uh, a lot of pictures, but we didn't get the picture of the cornerstone. And so we, and there were Masonic cornerstones on both those churches. And we went back, I was, told my son, well, Kenneth, let's go back and get that cornerstone. Nobody yeah. was there the first time. But it was the second time, there were three young men working in the yard, and the one on the right or more was the girl. <laughs> and he was shouting, his uncle Boykin and his aunt Catherine, brother and sister, lived right next door to each other. Catherine Durham Hope has passed away since then. I'm not sure about Boykin Durham, if he's still with us or not, but uh, mm. I got two good interviews there, and uh, my son-in-law well expressed it when he said that mm. um, we, uh, when we went to South Carolina, we didn't meet one mean person. Everybody we met was nice, and they seemed like they really wanted to help us. Indeed, that's that's the uh, the southern hospitality that they speak of, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. It is. <laughs> it was wonderful. Yes, yes. And you know what I really yeah. enjoyed in this book, my brother, is how you have com uh, compiled many of the photographs in your search, such as the Dur mm -hmm. Durham uh, Mer Merchant Tiles in South Carolina, the Starlight Masonic Lodge in Mansfield, Louisiana, the AME Church in Mansfield. So it just goes to show you how extensive this family and their contributions were from all uh, aspects of life in terms of doing what they were doing in yes. all these different industries. And that, it, it, it was a pleasure now, for me to re read in and learn about it. This year, this is 2022, something I, I plan to do this year I've not done yet. Mm -hmm. For Ancestry.com, this is st federal census records are confidential mm -hmm. for 72 years, mm -hmm. which means uh, that uh, this year, the 1950 census will be, is available to the public. I assume it already is. I haven't uh, checked it out, mm -hmm. but uh, there was a black woman named Fanny Durham listed, well, she and her husband Henry were listed in the 1910 census in DeSoto Parish. They're not listed in 1920 or 1930. Um, Fanny is listed in 1940. She was a widow woman, so I assume that Henry had died at some point. And uh, there are no black Durhams in DeSoto Parish today. Mm -hmm. I'm curious to see if Fanny was still there in 1950. Uh, the, when we, we went there, uh, I preached at St. James Amy Church uh, since the book was published. And yeah. I spoke at the Mansfield Female College Museum, which is a very interesting place. And the uh, uh, that picture of that lodge hall, I had met. In fact, there's pictures of of me with a couple of the brothers, uh, Prince Hall brothers from uh, there. Uh, we had lunch. That was the day I was there for the battle reenactment. Yes. At the battlefield of Mansfield. Mm -hmm. And it was it was a very very interesting event. Yeah, the uh, let me see here. Um, 
Yep, it's right here. Yeah, it, it, uh, I think there is. I thought it was in the book when there was at a maybe I, maybe it's not in here that uh, there were uh, two of the, the Prince Hall brothers that there's a picture of Starlight Lodge. OK, well, the picture mm -hmm. I have a picture at a barbecue place in Mansfield. Yes. Uh, yes. Which uh, I'm, I'm having I had lunch with with uh, two brothers. Uh, one of them uh, met me at the at the battlefield that day and and the, the that barbecue place is not far from from the battlefield the starlight lodge in mansfield louisiana we stopped by there that day i have never been to a meeting there mm -hmm. uh but uh on our way after the service and there was some um it was members of the Golden Circle, the Ladies Auxiliary to the Scottish Rite was meeting there. Right. They were fixing for a meeting, and some of them were also members of the Daughters, the Auxiliary to the Shriners, to which my wife was uh, belongs. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, uh, a couple of them, came out to the car uh, to meet Daughter Russell while we were there. But they, they were very nice. And I have have not been been to a meeting there in uh, Louisiana. Uh, there's problems within the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Louisiana, I'm told, which I'm not going to go into. But anyway, I've never been to a, a, a tile lodge meeting in Louisiana, but I know some of the Louisiana brethren. Indeed, indeed. And, you know, let's hope in the future, my brother, that things continue to progress in the manner that they are. Which goes to my next question, Brother Bob, is to those that are about to go on this journey to research their family tree, for eight to 10 generations, what advice would you give them? Okay, and this is the same thing Alex Haley said. Mm -hmm. uh, get your, meet with your oldest family members mm -hmm. uh, that uh, have them tell you about their parents, their grandparents, as much information as they can provide. Write it down. Get them on a tape recorder if you can. And then, again, uh, you can go to the library. Uh, I've, when my book came out, I've spoken in a number of genealogical societies. I remember in my hometown of Waco, I spoke to the Central Texas Genealogical Society, and there was a black woman there that was interested in doing that type of thing and was wanting some advice. I said, uh, this is the Central Texas Genealogical Society. I urge you to join and I urge you to do so. And I, there's, there's plenty of people here now who are skilled researchers. They know what they're doing. Yeah. They'll be more than happy to help in, in, in the research that you're doing the, for beginners. There are plenty of workshops you can take, some in person, some online for genealogy for beginners. Now, black genealogy is a little bit different in the sense that uh, records of slaves were not kept that well, but that's that's gotten better. Uh, there's more resources available there. And the, the bottom line is don't give up. When you run into a brick wall, you fall down, you get back up again. Keep chipping at it. Yes. Uh, don't take no for an answer. You'll get there eventually. Indeed. indeed. And, and, and I thank you, my brother, because... That advice in, in today's world where there's so much chaos and discouragement and division, I thank you for this advice that you have given. So once, once you set your mind and heart on something, just know that if God brought you to that realization, then you do have what it takes to make sure you see the job through. And I thank you so much for that. And uh, also what I really noticed about the Durham family is that they, they were very involved in their church communities. And also, did you come across any that were a part of the AME community, the Bethel AME, and uh, to find those extensive church family members within that circle of the Durham family? Uh, there's no, no Durham member, Bethel, uh, well, I mentioned, you're talking about Bethel AME in Philadelphia or, or where I am in Corsicana? Uh, just, just, no the, uh, just, just the, like, uh, finding the, the Durham church, family well, in the church communities. Uh, there was a brother, um, Ollie Durham, who 
was a member of Smith Chapel Amy Church in Dallas. He's dead now. He was originally from San Mark, uh, well, from Welder in South Texas, and he lived in San Marcos for a while. Mm. And he, uh, I interviewed him one time. It's my understanding he lived to be over 100 years old. Mm-hmm. And uh, he, if he was any relation to this family, it's very, very distant. Uh, he, uh, we were talking about Durham, North Carolina, and he said some uh, times he'll say, yeah, my name is Ollie Durham, just like that Durham tobacco. <laughs> you know, Bull Durham, it's in the book. Yes. And uh, it, uh, have you been to Durham, North Carolina? Uh, North Carolina is on my list. I have to yet still go, go there. I have. I've never been to Durham, North Carolina yet. I've only been to, you know, Fairfield County, South Carolina once. I've been mm-hmm. to Minnesota, Paris, Louisiana several times. Uh, when I had, when I was texting my wife back and forth on, on our <laughs> way, we had crossed over from Georgia into South Carolina, and she texted me back, how long will it take to get to Durham? Well, we're not going to Durham, we're going to Winsboro, but yeah, I know what she knew what she meant. Uh, but there are Durham's of various denominations. Uh, the and in Freestone County, we have a church, had a church in the Butler community, Wayman Chapel. Sadly, it's closed. They didn't have any Durham's that were members there. Mm-hmm. Uh, the two main churches for the Durham's in Freestone County, one is Union United Methodist, the other is Lone Star Baptist. Uh, now, all around the country, I mean, like they're Baptist, Methodist, Church of God in Christ. And I mentioned... Uh, 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 you know, Holly Durham asked, he said that he had knew uh, lawyer uh, William J. Durham. He didn't know if they were kin or not, but uh, he had a different background. I got his picture in there. And when I wrote to uh, General uh, Archer L. Durham, yes. he, uh, he wrote me back and said, none of the uh, names and places that you I mentioned in your letter are re- relevant to my fam- family history to the best of my knowledge. And he told me about his his background. And he said, I wish you well in your uh, genealogical research. And I appreciate the fact that you took time to answer my letter. But uh, yeah, yeah. And since then, I've, I've discovered a picture of, uh, of General Archer L. Durham at an airport in 1981 greeting President Gerald Ford, which was... That was pretty neat. Oh, here, here he is, Major General Archie Dur- yeah. uh, Durham, great, great American hero. Mm-hmm. And yeah. to my knowledge, he's—I think he's still living. I haven't heard otherwise. Yeah, he should be alive because uh, he retired in, um, in uh, I believe, 1989. Yeah, he retired in 1989, yes. so he should should still be around. Yes. And his, his life is very commendable and, uh, for the Durham family. Mm-hmm. There have been a lot of them in the military. I uh, mentioned uh, Bascom Durham passed away last year, and he uh, he had been the first airborne from uh, uh, Prairie View A&M, mm-hmm. and he was in ROTC there. Uh, he told me he completed his tour of duty at the Pentagon on September 30th, 2000 less than a year before 9-11. Yes. And then uh, he later was involved in cleanup of, of Ground Zero. He talked with Don Durham on the phone on one occasion. And Don was work like I say, and for those listening in, uh, Don Durham was white, uh, Baskin Durham was black. Uh, but anyway, Don was... Uh, when he called me in 83, he was working at the Pentagon. Mm-hmm. And I thought about him on 9-11. And, but by then he had retired and was living in, uh, uh, in Shawnee, Kansas. And he, uh, I said, thank God you're not at the Pentagon anymore. And he said he was watching the uh, reports and they it looked like his office area was being hit when he saw, you know, the terrorist attacks. Mm-hmm. But uh, he, uh, he has, has since passed away, but he was a tremendous help to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, Don was. And 
Uh, I have since then I had uh, exchanged email with his widow, uh, her name was Carol, and with some others, and uh, included that in, in my book. Uh, Don had done extensive research. The one story that I report that uh, in Mansfield, that Don said there it was not true at all. Um, John Franklin Durham II was supposed to have been the courier of Mansfield. Uh, the Confederate general was Nathaniel, I'm sorry, was Richard Taylor. The Union general was, was Nathaniel Banks. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Nathaniel Banks was a member of Monitor Lodge in Massachusetts. I was unable to find a Masonic membership for General Taylor. But uh, uh, the story is that uh, he, uh, that John Franklin Durham brought the message that the Yankees were coming to General Taylor. But the problem is, according to Don, uh, John Franklin Durham II was only like four years old at that time. So <laughs> now children started riding horses pretty early back then. <laughs> but yeah, that, that stretches me. To have a four-year-old child on a horse to go into the battlefield, that is, that, that, that would have been very unusual. But yeah, they, they did. And I was, uh, some, uh, some children, when I've shown them pictures of the Durham bull from Durham, North Carolina, they'll think it's a cow. But I have a <laughs> granddaughter, when I showed her the picture, the little girl, and she, I said, what's that, Alicia? She said, a oh, horsey. And uh, <laughs> I told Don Durham that. He said, uh, yeah, a real style horse <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> that's well uh as a child she didn't know but the, uh, oh. <laughs> yeah a cow and a bull look a lot alike but a horse is <laughs> something totally different indeed my brother indeed and you know speaking of the durham family were there any that stood out to you that were involved in the civil rights movement in the 60s that that really did what they did in terms of being an activist I know, I know there's a, a William well, J. Durham, who was a civil rights activist. Yeah, in fact, I've been told that he did a, for a lot of the, he was the main lawyer on the Sweat case. Mm -hmm. Herman Sweat, the desegregation of the, um, of the University of Texas Law School. Mm -hmm. And I saw him, Eamon Sweat was his name. But anyway, uh, in some of those cases, a lot of the legal work was done by um, W.J. Durham, but Thurgood Marshall got the credit for it. Right, and right. It's uh, a far uh, as far as the family goes. I'm sure they stood for civil rights. Now, as far as playing any key roles in any of the organizations, uh, many were were and are members of the NAACP. As far as you know, leadership roles, I'm not sure. I do remember, you may remember this story of uh, Taxanita Durham Blewett, who she's passed away since then. Very sweet lady. Uh, the, she was descended from, uh, from Isaac Durham. But she went to nursing school in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. her, her father, that was Hobart Durham, put her on the train in Palestine. That was in 1957. Mm -hmm. And when she went through Little Rock, that was during the time of the desegregation of Central High School, she hid under the seat until she was safely through. Mm -hmm. Because uh, she was just scared of what was going on there. And of course, uh, mm -hmm. that was uh, when Faubus was governor. You know, and, uh, you ever seen the Ernest Green story? No, I'm not it's aware a very good of that. Movie. Ernest Green was a the first uh, African American graduate of uh, high school in Woolwalk, and he he was uh, he later held a position in the department, a pretty high position in the Department of Labor mm -hmm. during the administration of Jimmy Carter. And, and that's absolutely amazing, even with W. J. Durham and the the things that he did, also with the NAACP and integrating a lot of the societies and systems that he was dealing with, which is another factor of why preserving this family's legacy is important, my brother. Which goes to my next question is, out of the seven generations that you studied, the de descendants of Gobi and Mary, 
which descendants and which a generation of the Durham family stood out to you the most? That's hard to say. Uh, of course, uh, uh, there was outstanding individuals uh, in every generation. Of course, uh, yes. Rance Durham is definitely one of my heroes. He was Deborah's great, great grandfather. Mm -hmm. uh, she knew him. He died before she was born, died in 1950, but he was uh, quite, quite remembered. His generation was certainly important. Uh, every generation was. Uh, there have been, uh, uh, James Arnest Durham is still living and uh, he uh, has been compared to Rance mm -hmm. as far as a, a businessman and entrepreneur and he retired from the um, from the fire department in Houston. He's got a ranch and he's got a tire place and in the Butler community and his son Rodney was in course can I haven't seen him lately. Uh, Rodney's a good guy. Uh, and we have some other we but prior to the pandemic we had regular fellowship with the uh, uh, St. John's Baptist Church in Avalon, which is between Ennis and Italy. Texas, and we uh, uh, descendants of of uh, Chris Durham uh, live are members of that church. We look forward when it's safe to resume our fellowship. The pastor Cook says we're patiently waiting, and that's true. <laughs> uh, you may remember uh, you know, Chris Durham was uh, uh, the one that he lost a leg and an eye in a boiler accident. Yes. I wrote that in the book at the Lakeport Cotton Gin. Yes, and, that's right. And his son, uh, Julius, who had settled in Ellis County, uh, I interviewed him in a nurse home in Dallas a few months before his death in 1980. And he said that his dad told him how hard slavery was. Mm. And Isaiah was his son, and Isaiah's deceased now, but his, he's got several of his children and grandchildren and great grands are still around but we're closely associated with them. Indeed, indeed, my brother. Thank you for sharing that. So moving on, how can- By the way, if one of the, yes. one of the family reunions, uh, my wife stood up and said, Bob wrote the book, but I'm the one with the Durham blood flowing in my veins. <laughs> And that, that that's, and that's exactly very, what it is, my brother. It's it's the you know the the beautiful thing is that you being married into this family has brought such a blessing not only to yourself but also a blessing to this family in terms of preserving its legacy. And Almighty God uses us as His instruments to do His will to make sure that the the right things that need to be done get done through all of us in our own individual efforts and lives and. It's uh, very commend commendable and honorable what you have done, my brother. Indeed, indeed it is. Which goes to my next question. How can the present Durhams and the present generation we're in preserve the legacy of this family so the Durhams of the future can know all the way from Gabi and Mary up until the future, what can the present Durhams do to preserve the legacy? And it's passed, Continue to make sure it's passed to on. Continue to record, continue to, uh, you know, get information. And I hope in a few years I'll get around to doing a revision. Like I say, there are uh, some who uh, I've gotten a whole slew of pictures since the book was out. Uh, one uh, lady, her, her bio is in my book, but her picture's not. Uh, that's Helen Durham Jones. And she and her niece, uh, Jasmine Carl, have been to more than one of my book signings. They've just been uh, so enthusiastic about the, this kind of work, and I appreciate that very much. And we've been able to bring different members of the family together, and I urge them to pass this on to the next generations. You, and when someone dies, uh, you know, provide a copy of the funeral program and other information. You got a newborn baby, get that information in there and let's uh, keep it going. And uh, when someone accomplishes anything, it's uh, mm. we're all in it together. And that's, that's, that's what counts. Uh, 
Um, I have, uh, there's, uh, so the name Durham, of course, is, uh, mm. well, it's, it's an English name. And if I ever go to the United Kingdom, I have never been there. But if I ever do, a must place on the list to visit is Durham Cathedral. I have, I'd rather go there than to go to London. That's an old Norman. <laughs> The Shrine of St. Cuthbert, I listen to their worship services on a regular basis. Mm. And I understand Durham, England, and Durham, North Carolina are sister cities. There's a very sweet lady. I haven't met her in person. Her name is Hazel Durham, and she is uh, an Irish woman who's followed this with friends on Facebook, and she's become friends with a lot of uh, the African-American Durhams. And yes. she... Uh, she was said if she ever came to America, she'd love to meet them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I know you're a lot younger, but uh, there was a, they're still around, but you don't hear much from them. There's a, a group, a folk rock group from the 60s called the Seekers. They're British and uh, uh, Australian uh, ancestry. And Judith Durham is the one female member of that. And mm-hmm. I was able to... Uh, uh, send information about my book. I found her website and one of her staff members sent me an email back thanking me for the information. I told her I had been trying to acquaint members of the Durham family with the music of Judith Durham, this Australian woman. And uh, she said, uh, I'll convey the information to, to Judith and I know she'll be pleased to hear about this. <laughs> so, uh, and there was one fellow I think his name is Sherwood Durham, who is of uh, of Indian descent, and there's uh, quite quite a few who's talking about uh, uh, British Indians, and you you may have some contact with them from Pakistan. Oh yes, indeed, and you know it's so important, my brother, just like what you shared about Judith Durham and being connected with the community here, because when I did my ancestry test, I found uh, fifth generational cousins that we shared a common ancestor. It was a a white woman from here, from America, from Iowa, and uh, a white woman from England. And it just goes to show you, my brother, this human family that Almighty God has created us in. We're all connected to each other somehow, some way along the line, but we just don't know. So for me, they would just tell me that you're born in Pakistan, and that's the end of that. But I'm connected to the, the Indians. I found Persian. I found Australian Aboriginal, Alaskan Native, the, the Kennewick men, which is native to the Americas. I found uh, European women that I was related to, and I shared ancestry with them. So just like what you shared about this Irish woman, it's almighty God in his grace and glory has created all of us as one family. We just have failed to, along the way, we kind of got separated, but I'm glad with the efforts that you have done and others are doing, we're all slowly coming back together again. And I thank you dearly for what you have done, my brother. I really do. A, mus- a musician friend of mine, uh, when my book first came out, appeared with me at some of my book signings uh-huh. and sung a couple of songs that I'd request him learn. One of them was Roger Whitaker's song, Durham Town. Yes. As he's, uh, I've got to leave old Durham Town, uh, said, I remember back, in 44, I saw Papa walking out the door. Mama said he was going to war. He was leaving, leaving, leaving. I got to leave old Durham town. It's a great song. Mm. And then uh, another song that uh, was sung was Winsboro Cotton Mill Blues. I got the blues. I got the blues. Got the Winsboro Cotton Mill Blues. It's uh, Winsboro. It's set in Winsboro, South Carolina. That old man, Sergeant, he runs a textile mill. Yeah, and he he's a slave driver. Uh, but that uh, the textile industry is not near what it used to be. But you see some remnants of that. Uh, some of those old buildings still stand today in Winsboro, South Carolina. But it's uh, uh, and by the way, there was uh, uh, one of our Prince Paul Shriners. His name is Patrick Armstrong. We had. Uh, uh, connected before I made my trip. He lives in Winsboro, South Carolina. Unfortunately, he was at the uh, Imperial Council 
in New Orleans at the time I was in his hometown. Mm. And by the time he got back to Winsboro, I was on my way back to Texas. So mm. maybe we'll meet in person someday. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. When, when, when it's meant to be, it all falls in place accordingly. Mm -hmm. And also, my brother, I wanted to ask you, is there anything about this book and the legacy of the Durham family, any question that I have failed to ask you that you would like to address any relevant information to the audience? Well, I think we cut, we cut, cover a lot of stuff. We could go on and on and on it. Uh, but, uh, it, uh, I mentioned Eddie Durham here, who was, a uh, a jazz guitarist mm. from San Marcos, Texas. Uh, Ollie Durham was from that same area. I don't know if they were related or not. And uh, this uh, uh, picture of Dr. Bartlett Durham uh, from Durham, North Carolina, and then in Tempe Herndon Durham, this was, uh, she was interviewed at 103 years old lived in Durham, North Carolina, was interviewed by the Works Progress Administration. Uh, the, uh, Benjamin Bonkin put together a book called Lay My Burden Down. It was interviews done by former slaves uh, at the Federal Writers Project was a division of the Works Progress Administration, one of the New Deal agencies that Roosevelt put in during the Depression. Uh, a lot of stories were recorded. Everybody's got a story to tell. Indeed. And uh, it's, uh, and we need to ha ha be able to tell stories and we need to listen to other people's stories and show appreciation for those stories. No two stories are the same. Uh, and just because two people don't follow the same path doesn't mean one path is superior to another, but they, they are different, but they deserve to be heard. They deserve yes. to be appreciated. Indeed, my brother. And I thank you for that. And I encourage everyone, please get the Durham's of Fairfield and African-American genealogy by our brother, Bob Uzzle. Support this work and preserve the legacy of this family. So my brother, any concluding thoughts that you have for the audience? Well, uh, I, uh, I need to send you a copy of my, uh, you only hit, there's only one of my books you don't have. That's got uh, the snake bill. Jefferson, the blues man. Yes. Are you up to reading that and doing a podcast in the future about that? Indeed, my brother, I would be more than honored to continue to make okay, sure that I'll your work that. is preserved. Uh, well, uh, have you listened? Have you ever listened to any blues? Uh, I have, but not. Have you ever listened to any blues music? I have, but not to an extensive level. Well, anyway, that's a very uh, important part of Americana, uh, the uh, blues and the spirituals and other uh, African American musical forms are have had an effect not only in the African American community but on America as a whole, and they have a there's an interest in the blues uh, worldwide. A friend of mine uh, one time performed in Israel. Uh, they have a blues society over there. They put big interest in England and a lot of other places. So that'll be our next project. Indeed, indeed. And I look forward to reading that book like I have enjoyed it, reading all of your books, Alephus Levi and the Kabbalah, Prince Hall Freemasonry in Texas the Durham family legacy. And now we will cover your fourth book. And I look forward, my brother, and I thank you again for all that you do. Thank you again for your brotherhood and friendship that you always give me. And for the audience listening, I will put the links in the description below where you can support and purchase these works to make sure that the great works of our dear friend and brother, Bob Uzzle, continue to live on in these times of great change that we're living in. So thank you again, my brother, and much appreciated. Thank mm -hmm. you.